آزادی بیان یعنی لون زیو فری سپیچ ویلکم تو دیس فری سپیچ دیبیت دسکشن ابوت انتی ابورشن پروتیس و فری سپیچ What we're going to talk about today is not abortion for or against. It's about the specific freedom of expression issues relating to anti-abortion protests outside abortion clinics. We're delighted to have with us on my right, Kate Smurthwaite, who is a feminist campaign performer. She's a vice chair of abolition, abortion, rights, abortion Rights UK and an active member of the Feminist Network. Welcome. Uh, on my left, Peter Williams, who is the executive officer of Right to Life, uh, a pro-life political lobbying group in the UK. Uh, what we're going to do is to give you each five minutes, just to start with, to talk specifically on the question of what should be the rights and limits of protests mm -hmm. outside abortion clinics. And if I may, I'm going to start with Peter, because I think Peter will probably have a more expansive view of what those rights should be than you may have, Peter. Okay. Sure. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming, and it's great to be with you. Um, right to Life is a, a moderate, a secular, pluralistic, um, and essentially um, humanist and feminist pro-life campaign. We don't associate um, ourselves with any particular religion. However, many of the campaigns we'll be talking about um, do have many religious members and are religious Um, in, in their basis. Um, nonetheless, I think these groups, um, I have a, a somewhat nuanced view of with regards to the kind of images they use, the kind of uh, tactics they use, and the sort of things they would say. I think Four Days for Life, the two campaigns we're going to be talking about, Four Days for Life and uh, Abort 67, are, are two very different campaigns. Four Days for Life is a very explicitly religious group, and essentially what it does is it holds vigils outside abortion mills. Um, it encourages uh, the women to uh, seek help from them in terms of advice as to whether or not they want to go through with an abortion. And you'll see, pretty much see um, them have little placards saying um, such things like God loves you or um, don't, don't make this choice, that sort of thing. We're here to help. That's the sort of thing they do. Now, Abort 67 are a very different group in the sense that they go out to use uh, pictures of aborted fetuses explicitly to make the case to women that what they're about to go through um, is the murder of their unborn child. This, to many people, is highly offensive. But the, what I want to make the case for is that whilst, they have, um, whilst I don't think they are right in doing this, they certainly have a right to do it. And I think we need to be very careful about using Section 5 of the Public Order Act, uh, which uh, forbids offensive uh, behaviour, offensive images of offensive speech, um, to limit and chill speech in the way that I think a lot of people would like to. I'd like to uh, do that just by com comparing different forms of images. Um, the first one we have here is... Not very pleasant. This is an um, anti-slavery image. Um, this is a, a, a chap who's been uh, whipped under slavery. Um, there's a more um, clear image right there. Would we consider that to be offensive? I, well, I think we would, but I also think that if there are anti-slavery, slavery did exist today, I think we would consider it quite right for anti-slavery campaigns to use this imagery. Um, this is the uh, iconic image of the Vietnam War. A great argument against the brutality that happened there. This, this little girl here, Kim Phuc, had been uh, napalm bombed. She had to tear off her burning clothes. She had left with scars for the rest of her life. And that was used very much, and quite rightly so, as an argument against the Vietnam War. This is another one where a South Vietnamese general is about to execute um, a member of the uh, Viet Cong. Again, something I think which would be germane to the discussion of the rights and wrongs of the Vietnam War. Uh, this is a more modern image of Abu Ghraib. This is a, another consequence of war. All of these are highly distressing for a lot of people, particularly people who have been directly affected by it. Now, I won't uh, include the pictures that I brought along of Abort 67, because you're going to put them up on the screen, um, but um, unless you'd like to show them. No. So, but there are other pictures that are also offensive, um, such as this one, which the pro-choices would use. This is of a woman who had been Joe Santoro, who died through a botched illegal abortion. I think that's germane to the discussion. I don't want to stop that imagery, as offensive as it might be. The point I'm making is that imagery in of itself can be used in an offensive way, but what makes it harassment uh, or not is the intention behind it. Abort 67, as much as I don't agree with their use of abortion images at an abortion mill, because I think that is unproductive, I think it's counterproductive rather, I think it is uh, hurtful to the people involved, I think it's, it's not a very good idea for the pro-life cause, at the same time, I think they have a right to do it, because what they're trying to do is not harass women. That's not their intention. 
Their intention is to show women exactly the reality of what they're about to go through. That, I think, we have, and that would be my case here, that whilst there are, is a legitimate discussion about the rights and wrongs of showing offensive images, there has to be surely a consensus that people have a right to show these things and therefore to debate them afterwards. And that would be my case. It's a very liberal case, and it's a case that I hope um, leads on to, we have the Reform Section 5 campaign um, coming about right now. I think that's something we really need to discuss in this discussion with regards to the freedom of speech we have and our right to be offended as well as to offend. Thank you very much, Peter. Can I just clarify your position? As I understand it, part one of your position is they should have the right to do it because of their intention and therefore the intention should be taken into account, yes. which is not the case under Section 5 of the That's right. Act. That's right. Although it is under incitement. It seems to be the effect, the actual being offended, that seems to be banned, as opposed to your intention in either offending in order to harass or your intention to offend in order to bring forth debate and to make awareness of a particular subject. So that's, that's a very useful, very clear point. Mm. Um, it's not, what's not quite clear to me is, as it were, part two of what you're arguing, Okay, so they should have the right to. Yes. Do you think they are right? I don't think they are right in doing it in that specific circumstance. I'm talking specifically about Bought 67. Bought 67, in my opinion, whilst they have a right to do something, they're not right in doing it. They, they are, it is not right to bring forth those uh, pictures in front of an abortion mill. In a university setting, absolutely. In a school setting, absolutely. In fact, it was being shown one of these pictures that converted me from being pro-choice to being pro-life. And then a few more, a bit more study. But ultimately, um, I don't think it's helpful in outside an abortion mill. I just don't think because. it's right, and I wouldn't. Because I think that um, it's too easily construed as harassment. That's not helpful from a political perspective for the pro-life lobby. But it also uh, could be highly distressing for women um, in a way that would not help them. There's distress, there's distress that will help, and there's distress that will not help. And in my opinion, it, it won't help. Thank you very much, Peter. Oh, yes, I do like that helpful kind of distress. We must have more of that. Um, and, and I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm quite distressed by using terms like abortion mill. I find that it's a clinic, it's a medical clinic. But let's just gloss over those for now and make a few points. So first of all, um, this is just the letter which a woman wrote to uh, the Brighton Argus um, uh, because she went to use a, an abortion clinic in Brighton and was uh, filmed by, uh, which we didn't mention, but both uh, 40 Days for Life and Abort 67 have been filming and photographing women coming in and out of these clinics. She wrote, I feel intimidated by being filmed. I was raped and I have post-traumatic stress disorder. I felt calm coming here, but now I can't breathe and feel panicky and judged. It's the last thing I needed. Um, and I think that what these people are doing comes down to two things. I, I'm not, I mean, I, I, I almost agree when it comes to use of Section 5 of the Public Order Act um, about offensive speech. I think people should be allowed to say things in public that are offensive. What I think these people should be arrested for is harassment, because chasing after women going into clinics is harassment, and, and it, it is illegal, and that should be enforced. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's, a, I mean, there's a huge, and to me, blindingly obvious difference between free speech and harassment. You know, you can write a website, you can put your opinions out there, you can write to your MP, you can write the traditional British sternly worded letter to the Times, but that's completely different from running up to women in the street uh, filming them, taking photographs of them without their permission, um, telling them all sorts of things. Now, the other thing which, which we have to talk about, um, because it's a tactic used by abortion um, anti-choice groups across the country, including Abort 67, but right the way through to some of the what we would consider more moderate groups, like uh, Society of Protection of the Unborn Child or the uh, Pro-Life Alliance, those organisations as well, is that there is a big difference between having the right to free speech and having the right to make up lies and propagate them. And a lot of these organisations will put information on, information on their website, which in actual fact is completely false. So they've gone to enormous lengths to try and suggest a link between abortion and breast cancer. And all the medical authorities say there isn't one. They've gone to enormous lengths to suggest a link between abortion and infertility, when again, all these organisations, all the medical organisations say there isn't one. And in fact, of course, there is a link between abortion and infertility, which is that infertility can be caused by illegal abortion, which of course is also in turn caused by people uh, not get, letting women get access to legal and safe services, which is what these women are trying to come and, uh, come and access. So for me, it's, it's got nothing to do with offensiveness. Yes, some images are offensive, and I think there should be a, a trigger warning, and if you're going to put images out there, people should have the right to say, I don't want to see them, or I do want to see them. Um, but what you don't have the right to do 
is to harass individual women. And, you know, and, and one of the things that you will notice about these groups is that they stand outside these clinics and uh, if you're a man and you walk past, you get left alone. And if you're a woman and you walk past, for whatever purposes, whether you're going to the clinic to drop off a parcel, whether you're going to the clinic to ask for information about contraception for your teenage daughter, whatever it is you're doing, asking for advice, or indeed going in there to tell them that you're, you're worried and you think you don't want an abortion anymore and you want to talk to them, um, you'll be harassed and, and rushing up to women in the street. And it is exclusively women. It's, it's sexist harassment. Uh, it's chasing women down the street. I don't see these people standing outside rape trials, hounding. Um, guys, I don't see these people, um, you know, going to these to these other protests and hounding people. What we see is direct attacks, and and, and it, it, you know what it comes out of. It does come out of a, of a religious, an extremist religious side of things. It's only really started happening in this country in the last year, um, but it's been happening in the U.S. for a very long time. And in the U.S., um, you know, and, and I'm not of the opinion that you know we have to draw a line, don't we? We have to draw a line. I'm not of the opinion that you know we should we should criminalise marijuana because it might lead to heroin. I don't think that we should always draw that slippery slope line, but we have to accept that these organisations in the US are also murdering doctors. That's, that's where these organisations have ended up. Um, and, and for me, there is a line, and that line has to be well this side of harassing people who are exercising their legal right to seek medical treatment when they want it. Um, that's, their, that's their right, and they have to be allowed to exercise it. Can I, because that's extremely helpful, can I just push you on where we draw the line on the slippery slope. Um, I mean, as I understand it, two activists were arrested under Section 5 of the Public mm -hmm. Order Act for showing the images which anyone can see if they click on the website. Well, I think Do you that think those... they should have been arrested for that specific thing, for showing those images at some distance? I think in that case, um, what we're looking at is images that people have a right to choose whether to see or not. So I think the right thing to do is to, is, is to have those images if you want to have them. I might add that I mentioned lies. You know, one of the things that these organisations also done is, is make fake images. You know, in actual fact, when we look at some of these images and some of the um, models of uh, plastic models of fetuses that they like to hand out outside clinics, doctors have looked at them and gone, that's not anything like what an aborted fetus looks like in actual fact. Some of the images are themselves lies. Um, but I think that people have a right to choose whether or not to see those images. In the same way that if you were going in for treatment for cancer, you might want to look at uh, footage of people who'd had a similar treatment, but you might also choose not to because medical procedures are never pretty. Um, I, I find I've never seen anybody outside a maternity clinic waving a picture of afterbirth, but I assure you, it, it doesn't look very cheery. I think you have a right to, to choose whether or not you look at those images. And so holding them up in the street to me, infringes on that right to choose other people. So you think it was right to arrest? So I think they were right to be stopped. Yeah, and I, am not entirely comfortable with the idea that uh, of, of which particular act they were under, but they were harassing people deliberately um, and and causing people who didn't want to see those images to see them, and that is a form of harassment. And so I think they were right to have been arrested. Right. Let me take that back to Peter. So by extension, if we show pic offensive pictures of slavery, if we show offensive pictures of the uh, results of war. Would you ban those as well? Would you say, no, those are terribly offensive, people don't have the right, to, they don't have the choice whether or not they look at those? Or is it in fact important that people do look at these? That in fact, they do have to glance at those. And if they don't want to look at them anymore, they can turn their head. Because what these images are showing is the reality of what is going on. Now, you might not agree with the interpretation of that outside, image. Do you stand uh, outside that's... maternity clinics with pictures of afterbirth? No, why would I? Why well, exactly. I? Well, exactly, because it's silly. Because it has nothing to do um, with the conversation we're having. What you're trying ultimately, to do, Peter, yeah, is draw an analogy yeah, yeah, between abortion and slavery, and it's completely different. Slavery is an infringement of people's rights, and what groups like yours do is an infringement of people's That's rights. That's begging the question. You're not talking about can the rights can of we, abortion. Can we, can we try and keep it in some sort of order? Can I push you, Kate, a little bit, which is in there's a famous case in the US recently where people were demonstrating at the funerals of soldiers mm -hmm. because they were so furiously opposed to the Iraq war mm -hmm. and they were saying soldiers are murderers and so on. Mm -hmm. Do you think they should have that right or not? Well, I think that um, people have a right. I mean, I don't, I don't think that you can never protest at a funeral. I, I've, I've done it myself, in fact, um, on, on a rather different subject. But What was the subject? Um, I protested at Sebastian Horsley's funeral. Um, he was a, a notorious user of prostituted women and he was given a very fancy formal funeral um, with the horse-drawn carriage and I wrote a sign which said where are the horse-drawn carriages for the victims of prostitution and I stood outside his funeral 
and uh, bigoted that. So I don't think that you can never, I don't think that because it's a funeral you can't go. I think that there are better ways of protesting the Iraq war. What they weren't doing, these people, is holding up graphic images. Um, they were stood outside uh, making their point through you know, text-based slogans. I think in, the, in that scenario it's kind of tasteless, but I don't think it should be illegal. But what if someone held up images from Abu Ghraib at the funerals of soldiers in the Iraq war, their point being this is where the Iraq war led us? Well, what's difficult there is that you're harassing people who don't necessarily support the war. Do you know what I mean? If you want to show those images to the politicians who've made the decisions, I think that makes complete sense. But what you're doing there is you're showing them to the families of people who've been killed. And, and if you were showing them to the soldiers themselves, I think it makes sense. But if you're deliberately showing those images to people who quite possibly um, are already against the war, I think that that's a, a misguided attempt to draw publicity towards their cause. Um, can we just take, I mean, let's leave the lies out of it, because um, if, if anyone who told lies were to be shut down, then the British tabloids would not exist. So well, that would be a wonderful thing. Let's get started, yes. Well, do you really want to <laughs> shut them all down? I, no, I really do think that people who deliberately, repeatedly, I mean, sure, people publish what they like, but when you've been challenged on it and it's been demonstrated to be false, you know, the tabloids, even the tabloids would publish an apology and retract their statement when you can demonstrate that something is false. But these organisations simply don't do that, simply go on and on spreading these lies. So there is an issue about false information. But let's put that to one side. Okay. It's, a, it's a somewhat different issue because mm -hmm. then there's the issue of the right of reply or the right of mm -hmm. public correction or the need for correction and so on. Let me come back to you, Peter, on the question of harassment. Mm -hmm. Because Kate's central point mm -hmm. that this is actually harassing people who are in a very vulnerable and often, you know, mm -hmm. necessarily distressed or emotional sure. state. Well, I would, I would disagree with her that Four Days for Life have been harassing women. I, know, I actually know the people involved with uh, Four Days for Life, and I know the situations surrounding the accusations, for example, that they were videotaping women. There was one particular chap who came along and videotaped for a, Chris, a Christian uh, television channel, and was on the side of the 40 Days for Life people. He wasn't doing it on behalf of 40 Days for Life. It was not 40 Days for Life who was videoing. And they weren't videotaping women in order to intimidate them going in. They were videotaping the scene. So that's just misrepresentation mis uh, there. And similarly, they don't crowd around women. I've actually been to these uh, uh, vigils. I have not seen one case of any of this. So if you have the evidence, by all means, show it. Actually, oh, yeah, I, have, there you go. I do a have. Being, uh, there's a woman going into the yeah, clinic in Brighton yeah. being chased by. Let's have a look at that. Right up to her. Yeah, it's that's one woman, that's one woman, I think that's actually from Award 67 as well. Yeah, that's um, Award 67. Yeah. yeah, I'm talking about Four Days for Life, I'm not talking about Award 67. I, do, I did say before, I don't agree with Award 67, and I think that they are wrong in what they do. The tactics they use, I'm very uncomfortable with, and I oppose them. But this is more like Four Days for Life. They go across the street, they hand up little, these little signs here, and they pray. Now, you might think they're very misguided. Fair enough, that's your right to think so. Here again, not exactly hard, and they're hardly offensive here. Not one of them goes up to these women and says, you shouldn't be doing this. Yeah, Not one of them crowds around the women. This is the actual general protest, uh, the general uh, vigil they had with lots of them there. So, and you can see they're not around the actual doors. This is actually after the clinic is shut in any case. Um, there's again signs, praying for an end to abortion, offering help. That's it. That's all they do. This is not harassment. So I don't agree that Four Days for Life is harassing women. But where harassment does happen, I agree it shouldn't. If there were, genuinely, people crowding around women, uh, harassing them in that way, if they genuinely were videotaping them in order to harass them, I would agree. That should not happen. But in which case, show the evidence, show where it's happening, and get the police on it. But the police have been around Bedford Square where this has been happening. And they haven't arrested anyone. I wonder why. But can, let, no, let's just tease out a couple of reasons there. One is something I don't quite understand, which is you, you, you said what matters here is the intention. Mm -hmm. Now, presumably you don't actually think that a woman who's made up her mind to have an abortion is going to change her mind because there's a group of people standing the other side of the street mm. with those signs up. I don't know. Actually, there have been women who have. Uh, you might think that's weird, but they have. Um, what those people are trying to do is offer these women an alternative to the choice that they've already made. And I think they have every right to do so. I think it's perfectly right that they do so. As long as they do so in a way that isn't harassing, and we, we agree on this, what I'm simply uh, contesting is that they do, in fact, harass women at 40 days for life. Of course, seven or say it's another, they're on the fringe, and I don't like their associations, I don't like their tactics. But four days for life I do know, and I do know they don't do the things that have been said about them. But I do think it does matter 
about intention does matter in terms of whether or not we are interpreting uh, something as harassment or not. If you're going to use a very disturbing image in order to harass people, that's different than if you're using it in order to essentially raise awareness of a particular issue. I think we did make that distinction very sensibly. It's very difficult to make that distinction because you can't read people's minds. And that's why I think we should always err on the side of, let's assume the best of intentions in people, unless we have really good evidence otherwise. So in other words, if they had also banners up saying, you're evil, you make me sick, that's pretty good um, uh, evidence to their intention. But if all they're doing is saying, abortion is wrong, here's why, and having this, uh, this image up there, it might be very distressing. But I think they have a right to do it. They're not doing it to harass, they're doing it to inform. I think that we really need to take that very seriously. I know, I won't. Sorry, go on. Um, yes, in answer to the question, are they doing this to raise political awareness or are they doing it to harass women? Um, I think there's one fairly clear piece of evidence we've got uh, to suggest that they're doing it to harass women. They're outside the clinic. They can start a website anywhere. They can go and protest in a town centre with these images and, they, and, then, and then we could argue that perhaps they're trying to raise awareness or perhaps in the wrong way, whatever, but you could argue that they're trying to stimulate debate. But when they're stood outside a clinic, they can only be, I mean, they're clearly not targeting the wider public to try and encourage, encourage discussion or debate. They're clearly targeting individual women coming in one at a time. And, and interestingly, you rightly say that if any of these people were to, uh, were to shout at a woman or, or, or to hold up a banner saying, you're evil, uh, you make me sick, that that would be wrong and that would be harassing. Yeah. What message do you think it sends when you walk into an abortion clinic and somebody is outside conspicuously praying? Clearly the message being sent is you're evil, because what do we pray no, about? We, clearly of course not. it is. Clearly not. Clearly, if you're praying for someone, you think they're about to go through something which is deeply regrettable and wrong. But that doesn't mean you think they're evil. That's Why a do I need to see you logic. pray? What difference does so it make? Why does know, the woman so need to see you, know, you pray? Pray at home. So that you know right there and then that there is someone who A, cares about you and wants to offer you an alternative. That's the meaning. Cares That's about the me. reason why they do it. No, it's got nothing to do with judgment. You might think that someone's wrong in doing something, but not judge them as evil because they're doing it. If you can't get that basic piece of moral logic, then I don't see it's how you can ever logic. interpret. It's really hard I don't think you can ever interpret right. anyone as being anything other than the wicked character you have in your mind. Let's just hold that a moment. I want to bring a few people in from, from, from the room, but just to clarify a possible area of agreement. Um, assume that there have some there have been some occasions of people being filmed. Yeah. That goes to a different issue, which yes. is the issue of privacy. Yes. Intrusion on privacy. Mm -hmm. Are we both? Are you both in agreement that that would be wrong? I absolutely agree. I certainly think if there's a per the person who was vi uh, videotaping outside uh, um, the, the clinic in the Bedford Square, I think he was wrong to do so. And in fact, I, I have said to uh, Four Days for Life that what they should do is change their statement of peace, which is essentially guaranteeing, saying to people, if you are involved in any kind of violent action, you're out. We kick you out. They should also amend that to say. No videotaping recording of any kind, in case, even if it's for the best of intentions, it could be interpreted in this way or it actually hurts people. So, yeah, we would totally agree on that, I assume. Yeah, we would, we would agree that there shouldn't be filming and photographing, and there has been, there's been a lot. Um, I've seen it myself outside Bloomsbury. Right. The other point, if I may, I just wanted, because you, you said in the note about how you came to, to be working in this field, Peter, that, that that process had started for you with seeing a particular graphic image mm. of an aborted fetus. Yes. And this is relevant because it's about the impact of images and the importance mm -hmm. of images. So could you just tell us briefly that story? Well, um, this was when I was at school. I was very pro-abortion, very pro-choice because I idolised uh, liberty. I idolised choice. Um, I thought choice was a good in and of itself. And uh, you know, I, I still am what I would generally call, you know, in my physical views, a libertarian conservative. So I do still hold to, to that somewhat. What changed was my awareness of the humanity of the unborn child, of which I am now utterly convicted. And what began the process for me of being convicted of the humanity of the unborn child, yet, con yet convinced of that, uh, was, um, was seeing the, the picture of an aborted fetus. I became totally aware that this is not just a block of cells, this is in fact a human being. And of course that then, you look into it later, you find the human being begins the point of conception, all this sort of thing. Um, that makes you much more aware of it, but the beginning came when I could no longer see this purely in the abstract, I was made utterly aware of the reality you can stress anything in the abstract, but unless you see the reality of it, whether it be war, slavery, genocide, abortion, whatever it is, whatever moral issue you want to bring up, um, when you are confronted with the reality of it, that makes a fundamental change. And that's what happened to me. And that's why I think that the, the showing of these images in certain settings, not in every setting, but in certain settings, like an academic or school setting, is very, very important. So, now, presumably you wouldn't have a problem with the proposition that in an academic setting, 
or a journalistic setting, these mm. images could be shown? No, no, not at all, yeah, of course. Um, in, in, in an academic or, yeah, clinical setting, of course, these images should be shown. So it's a specific setting in front of the... Mm. Yeah, it's whether they're yeah. deliberately being used as, as a, to, 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 yeah, to harass women. That's but that's so cynical, you're assuming intention. When it's in fact, that intention yeah. needs not it's exist. It's blindingly obvious what's going it's on. Because it's people not necessarily the case. Abortion clinics. Who, who else do they think is going in and out of abortion clinics? Well, oh, they're trying to do. my local MP will be wandering past and will see Clearly. this and vote differently in the House Clearly, of Commons. Clearly, if they're outside no. Bedford Square, they're trying to convince not just the, the public, but they're also trying to convince these women that this is in fact what's going on. This is in fact what they're about to go through. They're not doing it because they want to hurt women. They're doing it because they genuinely <laughs> care about those women. They don't want them to go through what they think is a, a truly horrific act. Now, to me, that speaks of good intention, not bad intention. You're assuming bad intention rather than proving bad intention. Well, maybe some women like having their bum squeezed, but it doesn't mean that, you know, because you meant to give them a very enjoyable, pleasurable experience, you're doing the right thing. It's not about your intention. It's about whether or not somebody has been harassed. And no. the bottom line is, if you've grabbed someone's bum, you were harassing them. And if you're stood outside a medical centre waving graphic images of, of whatever... When somebody is trying to seek medical treatment, obstructing their path, as has happened, um, praying, making a big song and dance about what's going on, making women feel judged, and we know that that's how women feel, then you are harassing people. Everyone, even if it was an accident. Anyone, anyone who has a basic point of moral, knees. anyone who knows anything, a basic point of moral philosophy is that an act, a moral action, does not just include its consequences; it also includes its intention and the knowledge of its intention. So intention truly matters here. And I know from first experience of these people, their intention is not to harass women. It is to inform them. It is trying to give them an extra choice. Surely someone who's pro-choice should be in favour of that. Can, can I just clarify one thing? Which is, I would have thought the main, just, just as someone who is a, a, a layman in this, I would have thought the main intention of such demos was to get publicity and media coverage and wider public coverage. Are there actually many cases of women who have actually changed their minds? I don't know how many there are. There aren't that many, but as far as a pro-life would be concerned, if you're putting yourself in the shoes of someone from 40 Days for Life, one woman changing her mind would be a justification for the whole thing. Because that one woman changing her mind has not only saved the life of her unborn child, it's also saved her from what they believe would be a truly traumatic experience, at least in potential. Um, so consequently, I don't know how many women exactly, uh, four days for life, if you contact them, they'll give you the exact numbers of women that they know have turned around because they've gone to them and said, I don't want to have this abortion, please could you show me an alternative. But even if it were one, from a pro-life perspective, that would justify the campaign. Because the intention there is not to harass, it's there to offer women an extra choice and to show them the reality of what they're going to go through. Right, let's bring in the group. Who would like to kick in? Katie. I mean, just on that last point quickly, I think uh, any numbers would be sort of hard to provide because... We don't know why these women are going to the clinic in the first place. We I shouldn't work on the assumption that they're going for an abortion. They could be going to talk about options. All, I mean, I, I think it's highly likely that women would turn around to 40 Days for Life and say any old thing to get rid of them. And sure. I don't think we can assume that they have accurate statistics on what actual impact they're having. But, yes. but anyway, I wanted to sort of go um, off this, this point of harassment. Um, a few months ago, we interviewed someone for the site on quite a different topic. Um, it was about parody. And it was um, Mark Thompson of the BBC. We were talking about a, um, a comic opera that was shown on the network mm -hmm. that sort of um, had a satirical image of Jesus. This is Jerry Springer, right? Yeah, this is Jerry Springer, the opera. And uh, Mark Thompson made an interesting distinction. He admitted that he wouldn't have shown the same opera um, featuring a uh, Muslim. Mm -hmm. And his rationale was that Muslim minority groups in the UK are inherently vulnerable. So it is different to make fun of a Muslim than it is to make fun of a Christian. So I'm wondering here um, if, we can, if we can sort of uh, draw a parallel with the use of images. Um, if we could argue that the use of images aren't uh, directly harassing, you know, not in the sense that women are, are necessarily being chased with these images, but that they're harassing because their target group, the, that their target audience, these women, are vulnerable while looking for this service. You know, I take issue to the parallel you drew with the, uh, the image of the slave uh, with, the, with the whip marks. I mean, African Americans are not slaves in America anymore, so there isn't... But they were. They were, but, you were, but I think you, you were saying if, if we showed the image now, or even the image of, um, of the Vietnam War, those images were being shown in the United States away from the soldiers and victims involved in the war. So, I mean, those are quite different things. Vulnerable to what, it would be my question. If you mean vulnerable to offence even more because of the psychological state of mind they're in, 
Um, very possibly. Are we going to I don't therefore say... I mean say, offense. I mean intimidation. Being, well, being, being intimidated to access services that they're legally permitted to I, I, As I say, I don't agree with the use of abortion images outside an abortion clinic for this very reason. I don't think it's right to do so because I think that it'll cause more distress. If anything, it might push women even more into an abortion because they're in such a state of mind yeah. than, possibly, not every woman might be, but um, than if you actually used something else. So, that, so I don't agree on the morality. I, I, I agree, morally speaking, the Board 67 totally wrong in doing this. They shouldn't do it. But legally. But legally, legally it's different. Legally, I think they should have a right to do this because otherwise we go down a very dangerous route, I think, with regards to offence. Offence being a... a, a, a a standard by which we chill speech. That, I think, is really dangerous. I don't want to go down that road. That's why I want to see Section 5 reformed. Um, and I, So that, that, that's my distinction here, the moral and the political. You might disagree that someone's not right in doing something, but you, do, you should think they have a right to do it. But what if a woman is, is so sort of frightened by, mm -hmm. by such a gathering that she doesn't feel confident accessing the services that she is legally permitted to access? Is that harassment? But the problem is, I mean, the possibility of that happening is certainly there. There is a certain possibility. But do we stop things from happening because of a possibility of something else happening? Or do we say, is this the intention behind it? Are they going out to do this? And are they doing it very explicitly? If you're holding an image of an aborted fetus and just saying, this is why we think it's wrong, that's different, as I said before, than if you're saying, you're evil, you may be sick, I hope you die. That's fundamentally different. So one, I would say, is definite harassment. It's clear, explicit harassment. The other is not necessarily harassment. It might end up being intimidatory, yes, but that's not the, the intention behind what's going on. So I don't think we go by consequence, I think we go by clear intention. Okay, do you want to comment? Well, this whole intention thing is an absolute nonsense, isn't it, Peter? I mean, not the really. bottom line is, anybody who's out there harassing people is going to say, well, I'm not harassing people, I'm making their lives better by telling them that they shouldn't be gay anymore, or that they shouldn't do this, or they shouldn't do that. I'm trying to help people. The bottom line is, you know, what's, what's actually happening? What's actually happening? And, and there absolutely are women who want to access services who are, who are being intimidated, and I think... To be honest, if I'm going into an abortion clinic, I would much rather somebody shouted, you're evil, than somebody sat in the street opposite and prayed at me. That's really creepy. Well, you're really in a minority. Creepy. <laughs> no, it's not really a clear minority. No, not really. Have you done a survey? Um, uh, no, lots, no, no. lots of people find that really intimidating, and lots of people find that really discomforting. And, um, and Just being prayed for, you find and, that intimidating. And if people really. want to pray, as I, as I think I already said, we've built these big, pointy, roofed buildings all over the country. Um, specifically, so you can go and pray in them. Oh, Could you please leave my medical clinics alone? This is this is this is how again. How can that not be? I think how can that not be principle. really, really obviously the correct way to go about things? That's what you want to do. You're essentially saying you're trying to, to pray in a church. That's really dangerous. Marry. Um, a question for each of you, uh, Kate. I know there's been counter demonstrations often at these um, mm -hmm. in sort of response to these vigils. Do you not think that's equally sort of um, horrible, basically, because you're drawing more attention? To, um, to these women and uh, to these sort of abortion clinics. Uh, shall I just ask the second question? Yeah. And then the second one, I'm not entirely sure about this sort of link that you're making between the images of slaves and the images of babies because for me, if I, let's say, you know, beat up Katie, which I'd never do, and someone sort of um, <laughs> took photos <laughs> and took photos, um, that would be justified because I'm violate, violating yeah. sort of someone else's rights. But you know, a child which is part of me and inside of me, I make a distinction between that and let's say an unborn child, a born child, so once a child yeah. has been born, um, someone can take images of me having beaten that child, for example, but I think there is a big difference. You can't draw that parallel, I don't think. I don't think it's the same thing, and I don't see do why you do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I. when it comes to counter-protests, um, uh, certainly abortion rights has been very clear that... Um, that we don't do any counter protests until we've spoken to the people who work at the clinic and we ask them what they think would be the best thing and what they would appreciate. So, what, in, what for instance, um, in Brighton, um, where some of the most aggressive um, protests have been going on, they've said, actually, you know what, we would actually like people to come down and help walk women in and out of the clinic and provide support that way. Whereas, uh, in other areas where there have been smaller protests, um, uh, Bupas in general has said we would rather um, that the counter protests took place but took place outside of clinic hours which is then we've made sure that we've organised them so that they're that way. So you're right if, if it seems like a counter protest will make matters worse rather than better then we actively don't do one obviously. I mean, I mean and in, in any situation if you're wanting to protest in support 
of you know a, a medical clinic obviously if they don't want you there then then don't you know and and here's the thing you know these are these are, uh, are, are clinics that provide medical services i think it I think it's in everybody's interests to make sure that we all do whatever we can to make their lives easier, and that does include getting the uh, the protests off their steps. So yeah, we, we would never, um, if the, unless the clinic asked us to come and counter protest. But but we often outside of clinic hours, they say please do come down and uh, see if you can uh, let these people know how broad the feeling against their behaviour is. Yeah. Uh, on, on that point, it's interesting just how comparatively aggressive the uh, pro-choice demonstration at Bedford Square was mm. compared to the very calm and quiet pro-life organisation. I know, so was I. Um, now, with regards to how your is it aggressive? Point, I'm sorry, I don't. Well, sh understand. shouting at people, shouting making lots of noise. Women. Yes. Yeah, and yes. having keep your own rosary off my ovaries and all sorts of quite. So You're actually, by the word in, in, ovaries in, in, or rosary, which of those words did you find offensive? No, I'm, what, I, what I think was offensive was the kind of anti-religious tone that it took. Having people dressed up as bishops and things like this wasn't was very nice. But, was sorry, you're saying you people dressed as bishops. It was well, worse aggressive. still. It they was... claimed to be in personal contact with. Hang on, but you don't mind people being yeah. offensive. I don't, I don't mind, no. I'm just saying it was, it was aggressive. And if you're going to be against people being intimidatory, well, you know, shouting at them isn't exactly uh, the nicest thing to do. But let me ask you, answer your question. The analogy that I was uh, drawing was with if you had slavery today, this is what I'm saying, if you had slavery today, if it was still legal, then if you had people outside a, a farm where slaves existed or wherever it were, um, and you had those signs up, you would think that was entirely justifiable because it was showing the reality of what was going on, which you couldn't see. It's like it's, it's, it's analogous in some way to the um, uh, animal rights protesters that you sometimes see. I don't agree, again, with a hell of a lot of the protesters, that, uh, the tactics that they use, but I think they have a right to be outside um, a, a lab showing what's going on inside. Um, that's, that was the analogy I was drawing. So I'm making a distinction the between of, someone, you know, another human being separate to me yeah. and a child well, that's that, inside me. I think there is a distinction there for me. Yeah. Well, for me there is no distinction because, as a, as a matter of fact, this is not something that is uh, just part of your body. This is a distinct human individual who is being gestated by you if you're pregnant. So this is another human being. Okay, the human being begins at the point of conception. So in a sense we're going into the that's, debate about abortion, which yeah. we don't want to do. But ultimately, I would, my assertion would be the human being begins at the point of conception. That is a distinct entity from you. It is not part of you like your pancreas. It is a distinct entity whom you are supporting. Now, you can argue then about the ethics of, well, can I withdraw that support and all this sort of thing. But ultimately, that is a distinct individual, in my opinion, this is the pro-life perspective, to destroy that life by sucking into little pieces or cutting it up into little pieces and removing it from your womb. That is, in fact, the destruction of a human life. I, I think we're going into the... So that's why the distinction is made. That's the, the, the abortion debate, yeah, I just want to... Yeah. There are several more people who want to come in, but I just wanted to go back to Kate to push you a bit on what you you, you sort of on pass on described as the irrelevance of, of intention because you know the law on incitement to religious hatred mm -hmm. and to homophobic speech, both those bits of the law say that the harassment has to be both intended and likely. Mm -hmm. It has to be both intention and likely. Mm -hmm. And the classic liberal free speech law position would be that you have to have both. Well, because otherwise, who judges what is likely? Right. Answer, in the case of Section 5, the police. And so the same powers under which the police locked up these guys, they lock up anti-war protesters, they lock mm -hmm. up anti-government protesters, mm -hmm. they lock up anyone they like under Section 5. But when it comes to intention, when, we come to, when it comes to intention, what we can't do is say, well, if you say your intention isn't to hurt people, or isn't to harass people, then it's not. The bottom line is, people can say something which might be construed as, let's say, uh, racist or homophobic, and they've said that by mistake, they've said the wrong thing, perhaps because they're not educated on the subject. Um, and once it's explained to them that actually there's a reason why we don't do that, we don't say that, we don't express ourselves in this way, then they should stop. It's been made abundantly clear to groups like 40 Days for Life and Abort 67, that their actions are found offensive and harassing by women trying to use the <coughs> clinic. So, so clearly, <coughs> if they persist in doing so, um, if they persist in doing so, they are intentionally harassing people because they've been told, it's not like they don't know that people find that harassing. So their intention is there. Now, they might still stand there and say, well, no, my intention is to do what Jesus wants, but, but, but we all know that, that they're doing it in a way that is harassing to women. I think I want to bring in couple of other people, the lady at the back and then Brian. Um, I was just going to say that it strikes me so much listening to this, how hard it is to separate general principles of what images you should or shouldn't be able to show 
and when and how you should be able to voice your discontent from whether or not the issue itself and whether you think it's right or wrong. Because, um, you know, for example, when you talked about the um, funeral that you protested at, mm -hmm. that was an example where to the man's wife and children at the funeral, I'm sure that would have been perceived as harassment. But you you felt that, that the issue and his using prostitution was wrong enough that that in that case you were willing to um, make people uncomfortable, you know, because of that. And the tricky thing with the abortion thing is, you know, for a lot of us we don't think it's wrong, but I can recognise that for people who do genuinely believe that this is a wrong thing, um, that, you know, it is making people uncomfortable, it, it is harassing people, but they also think that it's wrong in the same way that we think other things are wrong. So I just think it's very hard to separate, to have, it's like we, it's very hard for any of us to talk about one general rule which applies without the issue itself, because in a way, you know, the purpose of protesting is to make people, make people uncomfortable enough to change whatever it is that you think is happening that's wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good, good, um, good, good. With, with Sebastian Horsley's funeral, um, and I, and I knew Sebastian, I, was, I mean, I was invited to his funeral anyway. Um, you know, what I wanted to protest was the way in which the funeral was being held, it was being conducted. So there isn't really any way of, of protesting how a funeral is conducted apart from at it. You know, it's difficult to, to find another way of accessing this. Um, what these people are wanting to do, they're, they're protesting, you know, really the law in this country. They want the law to be different. And for me, if you want the law to be different, you should be protesting your MP. But is that, um, let's say, and I, and I sound like I'm defending abortion, which I really, uh, um, I mean, defending pro-life groups, which I'm really not. Hmm. But for them, you know, the law used to be anti-slavery and anti lots of things, and they genuinely feel that it's wrong. Mm. And so, you know, we wouldn't have said with slavery, like, go through your legal routes to... Mm. Because slow and careful and legal things isn't what changes things. Like, people have to... So I'm just saying it depends so much on where you fall on the actual issue, what you think is acceptable as an avenue of protesting mm. that. That's a pretty much the, the point you've just made about the, yeah. the slave thing is exactly what I was about to say. But ultimately, this does, it does come down to intention. It does come down to actual basic empathy. I can empathise with the pro-choices. I can see where they're coming from on this. I can, I've been in that position. So I know why they think the way they think, and or, yeah. but I can also look at 40 Days for Life and actually ask them, going up to these people, actually asking them why they're doing this would be quite helpful actually in many people's cases. Um, and I actually know that their intention here is not to harass women. You say, if you want to say, well, they know that some women find it harassing, well, there are all sorts of women who don't find it harassing. And in fact, there are a lot of women who are involved in 40 Days for Life who would say, well, if I were in a pregnancy situation here, I wouldn't find it harassing. As far as they're concerned, they are trying to give someone kindness, compassion and help. They're trying to help people. You might disagree with that, you might think it's entirely unfounded, but nonetheless that's what they're trying to do. They're not trying to harass people. And then tension in this case, for me, is fundamentally important as a basic empathy with your opponents, which I, I think is quite right, but lacking um, on the other side of this. But, but let's just, because that's in a way going back to the same old argument, but just to take your funeral again. Mm -hmm. I mean, presumably his surviving relatives could have felt harassed by your protest. Yeah, and they did, and they, and, they, and, the, and they contacted the police, and the police moved me on, and yeah. And, and you thought the police were wrong to move you on, or right to move you on? I felt that, well, I mean, yeah, I, obviously I was there, and I wanted to stay there, um, but I didn't argue with the police in the end, not, 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 not least because I didn't have an afternoon to waste getting arrested and, and getting bailed, so, um, so I moved along when I was asked to. But, um, but yes, um, inevitably there were people who felt harassed by that, sure, um, and I felt that so the point how was is making... that different? I mean, this is going to the question from the back. How is that different from the harassment you object to? Because, well, I, well first of all, I wasn't accessing a, a medical service. I wasn't there no, to but, seek you know, one's, medical treatment, one's which I'm legally entitled. But, but my Secondly, know, husband's or father's a... funeral is a fairly emotional moment. They were trying to access the service of a funeral. Well, That's and they the were able to do so, yeah. yeah but, yeah, and no, no, but hang on, if you could just hold on there, because I just want to pursue this calmly, because it seems to me it's an important point, which is the one you were making from the back, which is that there may be, as it were, the same neutrally regarded act of harassment, which we uh, give a mo different moral weight to because of our judgment on, on the cause. Well, absolutely. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I quite agree that there is a way in which, in which inevitably, when somebody's out there, you know, when we see people out on the streets with the, you know, enormously homophobic 
uh, messages out there. And you know, and I think that one of the reasons that, that this is so harassing is because it's sexist, is because it's directly attacking people's human rights. It's directly threatening people's ability to exercise their basic fundamental human rights. Incidentally, whoever is editing the video of this, I hope you'll put some ironic statement on the phrase, I can empathise. With, I just, it just amazes me that we discuss um, harassing women seeking medical services and a man without a uterus says, I can empathise with these people. Oh, that's not sexist at all. Or question begging. But, but you would, since the subject is free speech, I mean, you would, you would rather be in favour of harassing Nazi stormtroopers, wouldn't you? Well, I mean, yes, of course, and um, wouldn't we all? But, so um, but, um, but ultimately, what we're not talking about... Um, we're not talking about women who are coming to a clinic to make a point about how they think abortion is, is right or whatever. Yeah. These are women, I mean, yeah. and, and there are times when we go out in the street and big groups of women show up and we protest and say, we want the law changed and we want better access to this and this medical treatment should be about. And when we're doing those protests, of course people have a right to come and say, no, we politically disagree with you. Right. But this is not a question, women are not coming to an abortion clinic to make a point about how they feel that abortion should be legal or more easily accessible. They're coming to an abortion clinic Quite, I mean, people come to a Washington who have spent their lives as anti-choice campaigners and go, listen, I'm really worried. Um, my 14-year-old daughter's been raped and I was wanting to know what I can do. And, you know, so for me, it's, these people are not coming to the clinic to make a political point. Um, you know, and I think people coming to a funeral, in, in a lot of cases, were making a point about celebrating the life of somebody. Um, they are making a point, and therefore we have a right to protest and to counter-protest that point. But people who are coming to a clinic are not coming to a clinic to make any political point. They're coming to a clinic because they need medical treatment. And I think as such, we have to respect their privacy and leave them be and let them do so and take our protest somewhere else. Let me take Brown. Um, I wish I would have stayed in the back of the room. I'm a bit intimidated at being this close. But I respect, uh, obviously, your, your um, opinion on this very emotional issue. And these are emotional issues. That's why we're speaking emotionally about them. And I'm just wondering, it seems to echo the point in the back of the room that this has been more of an abortion debate, not so much a free speech debate. And I think that for a lot of social issues, free speech becomes a tool and it becomes a way for you to advocate, advocate for your specific cause. With the Section 5 reform, we see Peter Tatchell teaming up with people from Abort 67, 40 Days for Life. Mm -hmm. And maybe in five years, another issue will come up where they'll switch sides. How much do you think that for social issues, free speech is just a tool and one that's very flexible? I, mean, I actually wouldn't agree with you that most of this debate has been on the issue of abortion. I think most of it has been procedural. It has mostly been on the issue of free speech. Um, what's, we, what we've seen is actually diff differences over... We have seen a, a sort of begging of the question when it comes to the abortion issue itself. Do you believe it's human right or not? Yes or no? All this sort of thing. And obviously that will affect your view on this to a certain extent. But I do think that, as I say, there needs to be a basic attitude of assume the best of intentions in people. Don't assume the worst, unless you have very, very good evidence, which is why I brought up. If someone has, is going around with placards saying, I hate you, you should die, that, that is a very clear and explicit in, you know, showing of their intention. But just showing an image in and of itself could be interpreted in any number of ways, and you have to assume the worst in order to say this is harassment. I say, in order to not chill speech, always, 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 regardless of the issue, regardless of the social issue, assume the best, until you have clear evidence. That's where reason and, and common sense comes in when it comes to look to court cases. If you feel this is harassment, bring it to a court case and let's have the discussion in there. But even then, you know, we always ought to err on the side of caution, we always ought to err on the side that someone's speech should not be abrogated unless there is clear evidence that they are really, truly meaning to harass someone else. And that's just the point I'm making. Okay. Well, um, first of all, the idea that we should, that we should always assume the best is all, is all very well. No, we shouldn't. We should always find out what's actually going on, shouldn't we? I mean, to always assume the best is something that, that comes up a lot uh, when we discuss um, uh, graphic, abusive, hardcore pornography. Um, you could look at those and go, well, let's just assume that she's an actress and she wants to be doing this. Well, let's just assume that actually, you know, she's consensitive. Well, let's assume that this isn't actually hurting her, that, you know, she's just pretending to cry or scream in pain or whatever it is. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's a way of looking at things um, that lots of free speech advocates would, would take and would um, insist on all the time. Um, but... I don't think that, we, that that's a sensible way to go about things. We have to go, hang on, this looks like it really could be In which case you've got considered evidence, abusive you? and harassing and so on and so forth. And there is very clear evidence that these people are out to harass women. The first piece of that evidence is that they're outside a medical clinic, not outside their MP's office, not outside the offices that's of not somebody who, not outside the offices of Abortion that's Rights UK, who campaign 
for a person's right to but choose. The, the other alternative, of course, is that they are there to generally offer women an alternative to what they believe is going to be a horrific choice they're going to make. You don't need to assume they're often, that they're there to they're harass not, women. Well, that is just not about cynical, expressing sheer speech. cynicism. That's and about deliberately to, targeting women also, and wanting to give them information. Also, different, the difference is that abort, pornography is a different thing entirely because that is not protest and it's not speech. Okay, that's a controversial uh, concept. I actually don't believe that pornography should be totally protected um, because I don't believe it's speech and I don't think it's protest. But protest and speech, when you're actually expressing opinions and ideas, does need to be very carefully protected. I just want to point out that my question was not answered and this sort of reinforced what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> it was answered in that it wasn't answered. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> okay, Sebastian, Dominic, Katie, Marianne. Um, so we have one principle that says mm -hmm. that we, we should speak with civility. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering, to both of you actually, would you throw that out and say that sometimes when something is really wrong, as in your case funeral, mm -hmm. or in your case abortion, you just have to ignore what other people think is civility and, and just violate their conception of civility? Or would you say that you're not violating civility in the first place, if that makes sense? Can, can I just... Uh, so the, the, the draft principle we have is we speak openly, openly, that's very important, and with civility. So mm -hmm. it has to do with openness yes. and civility, but all kinds of uh, human difference. Would you, you like to go first? Um, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, a big fan of civility, to be honest. I, don't, I, yeah, I think if you have an opinion, uh, I don't think anybody has that. It's, it comes down to this, because first of all, civility is a complete matter of opinion, you know. Um, I'm constantly wandering around, people, go, people think they're being very polite, calling me miss or love, and then I turn around and go, actually, <laughs> no, that's not how I like to be addressed. And by the same token, I think I'm being very respectful when I say, oh, look, it's Rowan Williams, and he says, no, I want to be called Archbishop, the Right Honourable, blah, blah, blah. It's, I it's a matter of... I don't think he wants to be called Archbishop. Rowan, I call him. Um, <clears throat> Rosa. And um, I, I, I think that the idea that that we shouldn't offend people in terms of being civil or being polite to people. I mean, in general, if, if there's no other reason not to, why not be polite? And, you know, it, it's a general piece of life advice. I recommend you all be polite to people. But if it comes down to uh, debate and political discussion and stuff like that, and somebody has an opinion which might upset others, I think that's just tough luck. You, you know, you're entitled to express your opinion. And um, I still think that's very different um, from expressing your opinion to, is very different to me, to harassing people. But don't you think a society in which civility is not the norm is one in which people are more likely to get beaten up, or indeed harassed, as you would put it, and then it tends to be the weak and vulnerable who get beaten up more often than the strong and powerful? Well, like I say, I'm not in favour of, of civility when, you know, when it's needed, but if somebody, is, if, if somebody is doing something that you find deeply offensive, I don't think you should be prohibited from saying that you find it deeply offensive um, and saying it clearly and blatantly and in whatever language right. you see fit. Is yeah. that a two fingers from the back? Can <laughs> <laughs> so I answer that point as well? Uh, let's take the two fingers and then come to you. I was just going to yeah. say that the risk of civility is that it reinforces the status quo and like women throwing themselves in front of horses or whatever was very uncivil and upsetting. So I think the risk of it is that, you know, we don't want the uncomfortable things to be present uh, and that's been true yeah. sort of throughout history. Yes, although, although, although Nelson Mandela and Gandhi didn't reinforce the status quo and they yeah, practiced an extreme true. form of civility, which was yes. non-violent action. So that's true. I, agree. That. I actually think civility is very important, but uh, yes, it does, people do disagree on what civility is. Obviously, you do have to uh, keep, in, you know, keep in mind some people like being called Ms and some people don't like being called Ms and all these sort of things. So you find out from what they like to be called, you call them that. If they want to be called Archbishop and the Right Honourable Grand Wizard of Oz, fine, you know, go for it. Um, Call people what they want to be called, and also practice civility. Don't uh, raise heat, you know, in life. But when it comes to protest, I do think that there is a certain limit. Uh, you do show you know, images that are offensive and all this sort of thing if you need to. But ultimately, I think it's more important to, yeah, just just speak in a way and assume the best in people rather than assume that your opponent is the devil incarnate. Um, so I think, yeah, it, civility is very important. Actually, there's a very good example of this. The other day, I was at a funeral. And uh, someone I know um, essentially called someone, you know, spoke very harshly against another person while they were at this funeral because they think that they are immoral for very, for very particular reasons. Now, I said to this person they shouldn't have done that because they're at a funeral. And you don't do that at a funeral. That's not the right time. And they said, no, no, you should be able to condemn someone who's engaged in an immoral action at any point in time. There's never a wrong place. Well, I disagree. I think there are certain times 
Well, you don't do that, where actually you just leave things be, and then outside that circumstance, you can talk about it. And I totally agree way. with you. I so, think there um, are times when people need to be left be, and one of them is when they're seeking medical treatment. But well, I, I think when someone's seeking medical treatment, it's perfectly right to offer them an alternative, and that's exactly what's going on. As I say, Bought 67 um, should not be showing those kind of images, in my opinion, as a moral principle. I do think they have a protected right to speech in that sense. But when it comes to Four Days for Life, all they're doing is saying, we're praying for you, we care about you, we want to offer you an alternative. I think that's compassion, I think that's loving, I think that's, I think that's good, I, I, that's perfectly so. I have to push you on this. I still don't see how a woman in an extremely difficult emotional situation is being offered the, you know, the information and the choice that she needs mm -hmm. in the best possible by way, by being confronted by a demo at the last minute before she goes into the clinic, should it not be at a much earlier stage? It should be should both. That information? It should be both. I think when it well, comes when it comes to well, it depends what you're talking about. If you're talking about abortion 67, I've already said I don't think that's helpful. I think that's more likely to push a woman more into abortion. I think it's likely to much more upset her than it is to inform her. But when it comes to 40 Days for Life, what they do is they simply have people, more, mostly actually, two or three people, outside, on the other side of the street, praying, saying, we're offering you an alternative here. We care about you. We want you to have an alternative. Now, to me, I don't think it is rational to interpret that as harassment. I think it is more rational to interpret that as they genuinely, if they, even if they're misguided in thinking this way, they genuinely care about these women. They genuinely want, genuinely want to offer them the alternative to the choice they're making. Let me, so, that we've so I think that's helpful. We, we've, yeah. had, we've had that conversation, Kate. Can I push you on the, 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 the other point, which yes. is, do you think that women in this country do have sufficient ac access to all the information, including maybe graphic images, um, uh, to make that choice? I think that the provision of information to women in this country about termination is heavily biased. Um, towards the anti-choice groups, towards groups like Peter's group. There are lots of organisations putting false information on the internet. If you go onto the internet and type in something like crisis pregnancy, it, you, know, you probably will find uh, some of the organisations that provide medically accurate, uh, balanced information like Bupas and whatever. You'll find a lot of religious groups which don't overtly say that they're there to try to talk you out of having a termination, they'll say, oh, we're here to support you the whole way through, and incidentally, and then they've all this stuff they've made up about post-abortion syndrome, all this nonsense. There's a lot of false That's information out there. Um, and, there. and we know that about one in five doctors in the UK doesn't refer for termination. So you go to the doctors and you might well be given, in theory they should refer you to a different doctor, but very often they don't, very often you're simply pushed around. So there is a problem uh, in terms of the information that's out there, but there certainly isn't a problem in terms of women being able to access religious groups who want to talk them out of it. That, there's plenty of those, there's no shortage. And it's, it's very interesting that, that Peter just said that you know, women should be offered this alternative because he insists that this is not a harassment, they're being offered an alternative, and they should be offered it both at an earlier stage in their pregnancy and outside the clinic. Well, if you need to offer it to people more than once, maybe you're not offering them an alternative, maybe you're trying to force it onto them. Well, perhaps they should always have the choice at okay. every single stage. Hold, hold that for one moment. Just to be clear, you don't think those websites should be banned even if they're mendacious and perish the thought religious? I think that websites that purport to offer advice to women in crisis pregnancy but in fact are in wholly intended to guide women away from having a termination and they should say so on the front page. You know, I think if well. you're I think if you go to a clinic, you know, and a lot of these places will set up on-campus um, pregnancy counselling services um, claiming to offer women advice about all their options if they find themselves in crisis pregnancy, and in fact they don't. And I think on the front door of these places it should say, we do not refer for abortion, uh, so that women don't waste their time. Can I, can I just pursue that? Who's going to decide what is or is not scientific and what should or should not be banned? Well, now hold on a minute, I'm talking about organisations that say we provide you advice about all options uh, relating to crisis pregnancy, but who in fact do not provide advice about termination. Names? Names, or all the ones that... All, the, I mean, all, all of them, what well, is all of them? Uh, all life, say they. Care, Confidential... They, they, they say that, do they? Right. Yeah. Okay, None good. of them say on their front page, we don't... If you're going to life, life, I think you know what you're going to get. It's actually just how amazing how sexist and condescending to women uh, the pro-choice lobby can be. You assume that women are stupid enough that they are going to go to life and not know exactly what they're going to get. Well, or they're they going not? to go to the Good Counseling Network and not know what they're going to get. Actually, life and, life, and, uh, life and Care Confidential both offer non-directed counselling. Co good Counseling Network doesn't. So if you're going to Good Counseling Network, you know you're going to be steered. But Life and good, uh, Care Confidential are very serious about offering non-directed counselling, so they don't steer with it. 
Right, Dominic. Um, a question for Kate. Uh, you made this distinction um, between uh, those who are making a political point and those who aren't making a political point. Um, now, in the 19th century, we have the case study of William Wilberforce, who's the great anti-slavery campaigner. Uh, he offended people um, mm -hmm. by showing them the chains um, with which uh, slaves were tied up, and also having published diagrams uh, which show the, um, the, the bodies and how they're packed together on the decks of the slave ship. Is it wrong, therefore, that any of the slave traders, which at a time where slavery was, was legal, uh, are shown those images? Um, Do you mean like, to see Yeah, I, I yeah. think I understand slave your question. Slave trade, but traders equal abortion. Slave, traders, no, no, slave traders are not... Uh, were not, didn't have a political agenda, and they're operating a trade um, which at the time was legal. Though now we'd argue it's more morally apprehensible, um, would you say it'd be wrong for them to be shown images um, of, of the slave trade? Um, it, I mean, it's, 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 it, it's difficult in the sense that, um, in, the, in the sense that, you know, I, I, there's, there's, there, there is nothing, in my opinion, that, that because slavery is, was such a horrific and horrifying and, and awful thing. Um, I, I really can't think of anything that I'd say, you shouldn't do that, um, you know, if it might end the slave trade. To be honest, I think that it is morally, like, like, like I, I honestly cannot tell you that it is morally wrong to murder a slave trader. I, I, I don't, it's just, it's such an abhorrent uh, piece of our history that I don't, think, I don't think any of us can sit there and go, well, no, it would have been wrong to, you know, to kill somebody who, who kept thousands of slaves and in conditions that killed them. It's, it, we're in a, a horrific sort of hinterground in, in that we find an example of something so awful that we go, well, anything would be acceptable to end that. Wow. The, the point is that that's got absolutely nothing to do with abortion. Abortion is a medical procedure and it's a basic human right. Uh, every woman has a basic human right. Um, to, uh, to, to do what she wants to do with her own body. And so it's, not, it's just not comparable because, yeah, there really isn't anything that, you, that I think you shouldn't do to end the slave trade because it, it's the slave trade in the same way that there isn't anything that you shouldn't do to end the Holocaust okay. because it's the Holocaust. Who, yeah. wants to, who wants to come in on that? Is it on specific yeah. on that, Katie? Uh, Dominic, um, I, I'm going to have a hand at your question. Um, I think that that's a false parallel because the slave trader is not in a vulnerable position. The slave trader is not um, uh, a minority group in society that, that could be intimidated in, in the same way. Now, I want to take your point that the intention of the people praying across the street is to offer love and an alternative. I want to accept that. Mm -hmm. That's your intention. Um, and then I want to accept Kate's contention that women who were going to these clinics mm -hmm. and seeing those groups outside are sometimes intimidated out of getting services. So accepting both of those things, mm -hmm. should that be illegal? If, that, if, the, if, if women are, in fact, being intimidated um, no, by, by the actions. No, it shouldn't, because it should Because I think your reliance on... Consequence and intention have to Your reliance on this intention is sort of, I mean, facile. They're, they're offering love and alternatives. Really. I mean, I mean <laughs> you, you would both. say a success is for a woman to turn away, to change yeah. her mind when she sees sure. that. So if she's intimidated out of doing it, you're saying it's not intimidated because she sort of loved doing it. What I'm saying is you have to have both intention and consequence. You can't have one and not the other. Mm -hmm. Both have to be present in order for this to be classed legally and morally as harassment. Can I just answer his point as well? Uh, I think there is a, a good parallel here. Um, you have to beg the question in order to say, yeah, well, well, that's because slavery was evil. Well, yeah, we think abortion is evil. Um, that's kind of the whole point. You have to beg the question that abortion is somehow, somehow a human right, which it clearly isn't. Um, but ultimately, there is a parallel in the sense that we both, these are social issues that we think are wrong, which we think are evil, or some people think are wrong or evil, and they have a right to c declare that they believe that that to be so. Now, eventually, the public debate will determine what happens regards to that. I think in 100 years, we will look back on abortion and think, good grief, how were we that barbaric? But that's me. You know, mm -hmm. you might disagree with me. Sure. That's fine. Let's have the debate. Let's not chill speech by saying, well, because that could be a, a harassment, or because we could see that as offensive, we're not going to allow it. No, allow it, allow it, let's have the debate. Just practically on that, aren't there many other fora and places in which you could have that debate? In which case, let's have it in all of them. <coughs> right, but, mean, but on all those other fora, such as TV, radio, sure. the internet, and so on, you wouldn't have this question of 
hurting the feelings of vulnerable women at a particular vulnerable well, moment. It's possible you could, couldn't you? I mean, if you were, if someone well, saw Question Time and they heard the, the words "abortion is murder," wouldn't and they had had an abortion, wouldn't they therefore think that? Oh, I'm, so I'm, to speak, your hit rate is going to be somewhat higher when you're standing outside. But it's not about that. This is a, their intention is not to, in, in fact, it's not to directly debate, although they do engage in debates. There are people who go past, I've seen it happen, where, and they will argue with them to have the debate. Perhaps they're not convinced, but they do have the debate there. But centrally, their point there is not to have a debate. It really is partly to, but also very centrally, to offer women an alternative. That's the reason they're there. As far as they're concerned, they're offering women an alternative. So, that's so I mean, I can see how for... A lot of people, the analogy to slavery is really, really troubling because, and, and at the same time, I can understand that in your frame of mind, you think this is an evil that's so bad that whatever means necessary has to I be I wouldn't say whatever means necessary. Well, I, I don't or, agree well, that we should kill well, the slave trader. Well, the, the, I don't think well, any means necessary is true. Well, okay, then let me put it differently. But so, so someone can say, I think this is an evil so great that some really drastic measure is, is appropriate in the abstract. I'm not applying it to anything in particular. Um, and I thought you were saying that you think abortion is quite an evil thing or quite a wrong thing mm. and that hence quite drastic measures, quite drastic, not as drastic as what other people advocate, are necessary. <coughs> but everyone can say, I see something really, really bad in this and that. Yes. Hence, some sort of drastic measure is appropriate. So I'm just not seeing how that's a, that's, a, that's a useful measure by which to say, just because someone genuinely believes that this is really, really bad, they, they're, they're allowed to resort to extreme measures. Because, because then lots of people can make that argument. That there's no objective way of saying, well, you believe this is really bad, but, but it's not objectively bad. That's why we have the public debate. I'm not ex I, I don't call what 40 Days for Life are doing extreme. I think for, uh, abort, abort 67 do things that are, well, I wouldn't even say extreme. I think, I th I think they're inappropriate and wrong and unhelpful and certainly counterproductive. But I don't think 40 Days for Life are doing things that are extreme. And I don't think that the, means, the ends justify the means. Uh, but, so, but for example, I don't think you should ever use example, lethal yeah. means. I, even, if, even if slavery, let's just use that, even if slavery were legal now, I would not agree with the idea that we should murder slave traders. I think there are certain things you do not do. Apart from anything else, it'll hurt your own cause. But it's morally reprehensible to do so anyway. By the way, the number of people who have actually been murdered by pro-life is in America. It's only in America for about eight. So they're not murdering people left, right, and centre. There have been a few people who have done a very it's wicked, a oh, wicked oh, action. Yeah. Yeah. All. Eight people is too, eight too many. But to, be, yeah. to, to characterise them as doing it all the time is just silly. Um, let's, let's no, Sebastian just push the point. I, yeah. I just have a problem. So the argument you seem to be making when you were showing the images earlier of war and slavery and so on mm -hmm. was that... Um, these are Im these are offensive images, mm -hmm. but but it's for a good cause. No, it's, it doesn't matter right. what you think of the cause. What matters is these people genuinely believe that yeah. what they're they're protesting against is truly wrong. Yeah. They could be wrong about yeah. this. And, but, they, but, but that's but the point of the debate. You're begging the question by saying, well, you know, well, I don't agree that it's an evil thing. Well, sure, I know you don't. But in which case, have the debate with them. You can't beg the question about whether or not the thing is right or wrong. In order to judge whether or not they're um, uh, protesting on it is good or, or, or legal or not legal. You have to say, right, well, look, they have the right to protest this as long as they're not doing it in a deliberately and actually harassing way, and as long as, so in other words, as long as they're not using coercive means, they should have the right to do so. And that's the point I've been making all along. But, sorry. Go on, um, Mary. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the funding of these groups, because they are being funded, a lot of them, by US groups, which are using um, far more aggressive tactics. The 40 Days for Life campaign is far more aggressive than the States. Having done some background research, they do have something called sidewalk counselling, which does involve going up to people and approaching them. And do you think there is a concern there that we could, by just saying, well, they have the right to protest, the right to free speech, etc., outside these abortion clinics, that that then opens the door slowly for more aggressive tactics to be used? Well, then you do that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, uh I don't agree that sidewalk counselling is extreme because all you're doing is you're, you're, going, you're going up to someone and you're saying, can I offer you advice? They say, no, you back off. If you don't back off, that's when it becomes wrong. But if you're only just going up to someone and saying, you know, I really want to offer you advice on this, I think you have every right to do so. You know, people have the right to talk to each other about the morals and indeed the, 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 the physics, as it were, about this particular issue. But I don't agree that that's extreme. But I can't help you about as regards to the funding because I don't know the funding of 40 Days for Life and I don't know the funding of Abort 67, although I think I can guess with Abort 67 it probably would be American. But, but 40 Days for Life is mostly funded by a single evangelical church in Brighton, but 40 Days for Life is directly funded out of the US. 
I don't know. Well, I think no. Abort, Abort 67 is certainly very much supported by that particular evangelical church. Uh, I don't know whether it's funded or not. But you're kind, of, you're kind of changing your view because you've gone from you know this campaign you know, organisation standing opposite the abortion clinic mm -hmm. and praying, um, which is all fine. There. They're also actually on the sidewalk as well. On the sidewalk, but there's a difference between that and you're moving away from that to actually approaching someone. Um, which is m much more clearly harassment, surely, than... It's not just going up to them and having that. a chat. No, but I'm saying we are now, and you're saying yeah, it's sure. okay to do that because it's okay to approach people. Because I don't think that approaching people in and of itself is harassment. It's the way you go about it. If you went up to someone and said, you're evil, you're scum, that's harassment. If you're just saying, going up to someone, can I offer you advice? That's just offering some advice. That's all it is. It's that's not debatable. harassment. Okay, so, so your position is... What's your position on sidewalk counselling? Well, I, I agree that... I, I, I agree um, with Marion that it is very easy to see how it can be harassing for women. Um, because for starters, they're making an assumption about what women are doing there, so they're coming up to you. And, uh, and, and secondly, the idea that people are saying, can we give you some advice? In actual fact, that's not people's experience. No, people but suppose it, suppose it were. Let's just take, mm. let's assume for the sake of argument mm. that there was some incredibly nice, gentle, civil person mm. who was incredibly gently and unthreateningly coming up to say, could I possibly advise you? Well, I still think that probably most women would find that harassing. But I would. But I would think, what are they doing? Well, no, but, but, what, what no, are they, no, what's no, going but, on? but now, now we have to press you a bit, because you said earlier on that you find the, the sight of someone praying on the other side of the road quite offensive. Don't they have churches, or can't they pray at home? Absolutely. Um, so, so the problem is, you see, that in a way you're both privileging your own subjectivity. You're saying that our feelings as women Mm -hmm. uh, are, are so important and so entitled to be offended that you can't even hold up placards the other side of the road. And Peter is saying our feelings of moral outrage at abortion are so important that we're entitled to come and, um, and buttonhole you on the, on, 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 sure. on the pavement. Actually, I, I think what I'm saying is that you should just assume on the side of liberty until you've got a really good reason otherwise. So I'm actually saying, actually don't privilege my subjectivity and don't privilege a Kate's subjectivity. In fact, ignore subjectivity until and unless there is clear, absolutely good evidence that, what, that this person is going to be harassed in a meaningful way. I'm trying to, object to, a, to appeal to an objective standard here, not to my subjective standard. And the objective standard is... Uh, again, the direct intention of trying to harass someone, but then you which are, I think is signified you are by privileging your subjectivity because you are the actor. Uh -huh. You are saying you are precisely privileging your subjectivity, saying so my intentions are good. Oh well, in that case, yes, then, I do think. Then, uh, then the road to hell is paved. Well, well I, suppose, I, suppose you could, I suppose you could argue that, but I think someone's right to do in this case to protest to speech um, is privileged. So surely, by human rights. If there were evidence. If there were evidence that you could accept that the I don't know, Social Science Research Council had surveyed, you know, a representative sample of women going to abortion mm -hmm. clinics, and the overwhelming majority said mm -hmm. they felt deeply, deeply offended, disgusted, hurt, harassed, violated, mm -hmm. whatever word is used mm -hmm. by such protests. Mm -hmm. What would you then say? I would say it has to be based on a case-by-case -case issue. It can't be based on what the majority of people happen to think in each individual case. No, but I'm, yeah, I, but but again, I'm asking you to assume a hypothetical. Okay, okay. We've had a well, social scientific... Well, in that case, what we're assuming is the consequence, but not the intention. Sorry, so no. you're, you're assuming... So let's, let's take for the sake of argument that the vast majority of women who go through this um, are, in fact, deeply offended and hurt by people... Pr uh, just praying across so we're the taking that as a hypothetical, yeah. Peter, and if we, if we took that as a hypothetical, if we said... Can I finish what I was saying, actually? Just yeah, but, but finish on the hypothetical. On the hypothetical, based on that, we've established, hypothetically, that the consequence is that this has harassing effects, but it hasn't established that the intention is to harass, and what I'm saying is both have to be present. You can't have okay, one without so let's, the other. let's push the hypothetical further. We've done the survey, all these women say that they feel harassed, We've then explained the results of the survey to the people who were stood there praying, sidewalk counselling, this stuff, and they continue doing it. Now, surely we have to accept that that's intention now, because, because they, they would... know what impact they're having and they're continuing to do it. No, because I think that it... is the reality of it, is they know no. what impact they're having and they do continue to do it. And so, of course, it's harassment, much as they might tell you otherwise, and of course they're not going to no, admit it. Because I think if they have also got experience of the, no the minority of women 
who in fact don't feel harassed, in fact who have been helped by this, and they might say, well, you know what, we're there for them, because as far as we're concerned, saving one oh. life or helping one person oh. justifies our entire campaign. Oh. So I don't think you do this based on the majority of women. <laughs> oh, so you would go slow Because that would save a life, right? No, hang on, no. your moral calculus is, is, is sliding a bit there. Because <laughs> against the 99% of women, suppose... Uh -huh. Well, I've said, well, 99% of women true. said we was, but there was the one who you could save. Yeah. You would save the one you could save. Uh, I way. personally, if, if this were me, if you're talking about me, I would have stopped this by now. I would have said, well, in that case, I won't be involved with this campaign, I'll shut everything down. Uh, I wouldn't do it because morally speaking, and again, I'm making the distinction between the moral and the political, morally speaking, it would be wrong to do something which genuinely was that harmful. But politically speaking, if we're talking about the right to freedom of speech, what I'm saying is that they would still have, I think, the right, based on their intention, because their intention, you might think this intention is deluded at this point, but their intention would still be, we genuinely want to help people. Mm. And they have the right to do something which is even hurtful to well, their campaign. Well, we'll have to gradually draw this to a close, but a question from the back. Well, um, well you're, you're sort of, the, I think I can, it might be rude, but obsession with intention, I think, is is misplaced because any morality based only on intention is... But it's not just based on intention, it's based on intention and. I'm saying intention has to be there. I'm not saying just right. intention. But secondly, also I think in terms of harassment, like we all know, it's, it's fairly, I don't think we need to do a survey, it's fairly obvious that it's, it is, that women will feel harassed if they're going for a very difficult decision. And that's, mm. that's a sort of fairly obvious thing that we can all, I think, agree on, that it's going to be uncomfortable. And your argument would be stronger if you said, yes, we really think this is wrong, and therefore, it's really, we are really unfortunate and it's sorry that it is upsetting to women, but we mm. believe enough that it's worth trying to stop or not to... Well, I, I, I do believe that. that. I don't personally say I don't believe... It, it. feels insincere. Though. I do think it's that. Annoying. I mean, I genuinely do think that. I think that with regards to 40 Days for Life, even if there are some women, I, do, I, I can accept there are some women who feel harassed by this, I still think that they, that the A, the 40 Days for Life have the right to do what they do, and B, I still think they are right in doing it. With the Board 67, Whilst I think they have a right to do it, I don't. Uh, they have a right to do it. I don't think they are right in doing it. I think it's counterproductive and, unha and unhelpful, and that's the distinction I'm making. But if you're going to say they are harassing women, then you have to say, well, all right. Well, what's going through their heads? It can't just be the effect is that they have. You know, some women feel harassed. That, that that's really dangerous. If you're going to judge it by people's feelings, how offended they are, how harassed they feel, my goodness, what else are you going to, to bar? You have to base no, I, on the reality of okay. what they're intending to do. Can we, can we, I think we need gradually to wrap this up, and so I think any last words, Peter, and then I'll come to Kate. Okay. Um, any last words? Ultimately, this is a, a really important distinction between the moral and the political here. I don't necessarily agree with all the tactics of all of these different groups. I think they need to improve in many different ways, but I find it extremely difficult to think that someone can rationally consider praying across the street from you, holding up a sign that says, I want to help you, and then asking you if, you, if they can help you, something which is harassment. I can totally see how someone find, having banners up there, uh, placards uh, with aborted fetuses, all that sort of thing, I can see why, that's, um, why people would feel harassed by that. But I think we need to always, always, always err on the side of liberty. And that means judging people by their intentions and not just by the results of their actions. Thank you. Kate. Um, Yes, uh, when you say that you can't see how it would be harassing to pray or to, you know, wave uh, signs saying we can help you and all this kind of stuff, I guess, I guess it's very, very easy for me to see how that can be harassing. And I, I can't help thinking that if you grew a uterus, you might be able to see it for yourself. Um, there is, I absolutely agree, there's a complete difference between what's going on politically. Uh, I think everybody has a right to make their point politically um, and, and, they, and they should be entitled to use whatever tactics they like, but not... Uh, to make their point on, a, on an individual basis when people are seeking medical treatment. And finally, this idea that all that matters is the intention is absolute... It's, it's, it, this idea that without intention, it's not a crime. It's absolute hooey. You might as well go, I'm not stabbing anybody, it's knife dancing. Ultimately, it's not about... Uh, you, we, know what, we know what the intention is because the intention is to repeat the effect that it has previously had, which we know... Um, has been harassing and intimidating people well, and it I, needs to end. There's clearly not total agreement there. If you would um, <laughs> like to come and uh, comment on this extremely interesting debate, do please come onto the site freespeechdebate.com. Uh, I think we've had a really fascinating conversation. Thank you both very much.